You can't just have a TV and stereo anymore. Now they're part of fully automated, energy-efficient smart homes. The good news, if you live in or around Asheville, Robbie Matrani of REM Audio and Video has you covered. REM offers an array of sound, video, lighting, security, and network services, all controllable at your fingertips from anywhere. REM is a registered dealer for all the major brands and can customize a plan for any budget. Get a free quote today Day by reaching out at remaudiovideo.com. I am a maker, a builder, a baker, although sometimes my messes are all that you'll find. I'll tell a story, both true and allegorial. The process is precious, so it takes up all my time. Chris Jaley says he used to mock artists who painted the natural landscape. At the time, he was a graffiti artist inspired by BMX and metal music. Since his move to Asheville, he's become one of the artists he used to dismiss. The plain air paintings documenting his local hikes and other sojourns into the woods are on view through the end of March at Tiger Tiger Gallery in the River Arts District. It's going to sound funny, but these feel more metal than the other work because it interacts with nature in some of the ways that the genre talks about. This is The Overlook with Matt Pikin, a podcast about the news, arts, issues, and trends of Asheville, North Carolina. My guest is Chris Jaley, who moved three years ago from Brooklyn to Asheville and now has his first solo gallery show. We talk about his path from graffiti artist to plain air landscapes and how he sees himself as documenting specific places and time. My conversation with Chris Jaley happened inside Tiger Tiger Gallery on the morning of his opening reception. I began my conversation by asking Chris what his work was like when he went to art school and how it has evolved. Growing up in Sonoma County, I think I w wasn't really too concerned about landscape or nature. Actually, I openly made fun of it at a young age. Um, what do you mean you made fun of nature? I think just making fun of the idea that, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to paint something. I thought that it was, I guess it was like this ageist sort of reaction to it. Oh, no, that's what old people do. Like, that's thrown in the towel. At the time, I was more concerned with intaglio printmaking and graffiti, having those sort of dualities that I was juggling and thinking about cartoons and surrealism and how visually wild I could go. Um, landscape was not really in my mind as much as it is now. Let's back up a second. How do you go from being graffiti influenced to looking at the natural landscape. If anything, graffiti is anti-natural landscape. It's mark-making usually on the man-made world. Having grown up skateboarding, BMX, graffiti, it's all about interacting with the environment and looking at the environment from a different lens, separate from how everybody else does. So, for example, a school is like an epicenter for BMX and skateboarding. The ledges, the handrails, these sort of like lines that you create by interacting with the landscape and how you utilize the landscape for your interest. Graffiti would probably be about the same thing, site-specific. You're scanning and looking at the environment so differently with regards to where do I place this thing, which makes me fall in love with what it is that I'm doing now in plein air painting. I'm taking those sort of dialectical ideals and applying them and reacting to the environment in a way that is similar to say oh this is like a, this is a line this is a handrail this is an abandoned building ideal and reacting to the the landscape with those sorts of terms in mind so you were already interpreting the landscape when you were doing that kind of work when you were graffiti influenced now describe for people what's the difference between strictly watercolor painting and plain air painting so i've believe just the act of plein air painting is painting out outdoors. I think originally individuals would go out and make studies of a particular landscape, either for color or composition, to go that then go back into the studio and create a larger work. And 
where I think I'm at now, using watercolor is like this very pared down almost just feels very archaic and I don't have to carry a whole lot of things with me it's brush water and the colors that I have and trying to interpret a moment in its entirety as opposed to it just being a depiction of the space. Yeah, that seems to be, from what you're expressing, a connecting thread between your previous work, your past work, and what you're doing now is that you're influenced not just by what you're looking at, but by the it, the environment in its totality. Has that always inspired your art? Is art for all the senses? I think early on when it came to some of the graffiti stuff, it became more about trying to interpret a graffiti piece in such a way that I came to a wall without any plan and I would make it up as I went along and the space would dictate what was being painted. I never wanted to work from a sketch. I never wanted to do just letters. I wanted it to be this sort of weird, enigmatic sort of thing that you would come across and you'd have to confront and interpret. So I I would say that there's definitely like a similarity that has been happening. How did you make that psychological shift from thinking the outdoor settings and nature settings were for old, older people to then saying, this is what I want to interpret as an artist. This is where I want to turn my artistic interests. I think what ended up happening was I, pardon the expression, I get my head out of my ass and just try something that is outside my comfort level with very few tools as possible. And after being in the middle of New York for 11 years and now being outdoors and, oh, I'm just going to try this out and see what happens. It's just opened up things immensely. And I think also having worked at Cheap Joe's and being around that massive watercolor display and just hearing people talk about it, it's like, I'll try this out. And immediately it's something that I don't know where it's going and I had no intention of it going anywhere. And it's oddly taking me places the same way that I hike and interact with the environment. So I'm just going to continue without plan or foresight and see where it leads. Did you come to Asheville to inspire or help steer your art? Was your art making part of your reason for moving here from Brooklyn? No, I think it was more just my wife and I just wanted to try something out that was different. I knew some people here previously from California. We had visited here, drove the 11 hours here to stay a day and a half and come back and then decided this is what we're doing. That was also during the pandemic as well. So the work that's here at Tiger Tiger, has it all been created since moving to Asheville? Yes. So talk about the impact of this. Clearly, you talk about in your artist notes that these are derived from being out on your hikes and elsewhere, and you're influenced by sound, feeling in the air. How, are, how is this body of work different for you because you're in Asheville than what you were doing before you arrived? I think part of it is I'm not in a white cube in the studio trying to riff off of myself and riff off of what I had been making previously. I'm not bombarded by living in the city, the white noise, the hustle and bustle of the city. But does the subject matter change? The subject matter is definitely changed because I'm not personifying everything. I'm not looking at it as if it's like cartoons or like riffs off of pop culture. I'm not also bombarding myself with loud music and a studio environment. So is that what you were doing before? Yeah, it was very much, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to put on some black metal music and I'm going to drown out the noise with the noise to create this cacophonous noise on canvas. And I think these are the signs of this departure 
departure. I would think this is a different universe. That the whole genesis of this work, the making of it. I'm a metal fan. I can't imagine listening to metal while you're painting these. And I don't, and I haven't. I know it's going to sound funny, but these feel more metal than the other work because it interacts with nature in some of the ways that the genre talks about. And it almost feels more genuine to that, but I wouldn't say that it's certainly not pertinent to it. I don't know. There's like a funny sort of truth about it, I guess. I was just curious, the interpretive element, you speak to sound, other forces coming into play. How do you see sound being manifest in these paintings? I think part of that is going to be the frequency of color, the way that certain elements are more saturated than others between foreground and background, but also the white space of the paper, the halos that are around everything. So all of that is bare paper that you see. And it, I think, think it's about managing the thinness, the thickness, the stacking of things. I'm not saying that I've figured it out, but I feel like I'm exploring what the possibility of that could be. Yeah, I, I was curious about that myself, about how you interpret what your own feelings are, what your own senses are. I imagine when you're out hiking and the sounds you're hearing, they're quiet a lot of the time. If you're still you hear a stillness. Are you trying to imbue your paintings with that stillness? I think it really depends on the day. We could look at a a painting, for example, the one that's right here, The Soil's Gaze, which is what the show is named after. I spent about maybe two full days working on that and then finishing it up in the studio. But during that time, screaming of cicadas, hawks, the woodpeckers were going off. So it's all those sorts of things that all of a sudden become imbued to it. And sometimes there's just silence. So talk about that. You said you were working on this for two days, then brought it back to the studio. So when you say you're working on it out there, you're out in that scene. You're not working from a photograph. No. All of these have started outside. Some have been fully finished outside and some are then finished up in the studio per time restraints or anything of that matter. But in order for these to operate and have a sense of truth for me, they have to begin outside and then they could potentially grow in the studio a little bit. And sometimes there's a few that I had abandoned because I felt like I couldn't do anything with it. And then all of a sudden... I can look at it and be like, I can, I, I remember what this feeling is. I can go ahead and finish it. Yeah, that answers a question that just popped up in my head. That when you bring it back to the studio, do you lose sometimes that what filled up in you when you were out there working on the piece? Is it, is it elusive sometimes? Is that inspiration sometimes fleeting? It definitely can be. I think what really helps is a lot of these are all the same area, too. So Arboretum, just outside the Arboretum, Blue Ridge Parkway, places that I've hiked over and over again and seeing them in different stages throughout the year, there all of a sudden becomes this like sense of familiarity and knowing if I come back around this time, around this year, I can capture this moment. And I think that sort of stacking of that is what I can bring back to the studio in cases where I work on some of these after the fact. More after this. It's time to clean the winter blues out of your house. You should really check out Greenland Pro Cleaning. They're locally owned in Asheville. They're eco-friendly, allergy-friendly, and they only use products certified by the EPA. Greenland Pro Cleaning has easy online booking, and you can get a quote in under a minute. Use the code OVERLOOK at checkout and get $60 off your first cleaning. Cross spring cleaning off your to-do list by visiting GreenlandProCleaning.com today. You said something, you'll go throughout the year, you'll hike, and you'll see these places over and over again. They change throughout the seasons. Let's say you have two different paintings here. Is one of them, let's say, springtime from that location, the other is winter or fall from that location? There's 
going to be different areas of the same area that are different points in time. So this one over here, the soil's gaze being October of 2023, but at the other end of that trail, which is Barricade Trail 4791, is like late November. It's like a, a wormhole of different experiences throughout that sort of a smaller section of yeah. Blue Ridge. What's interesting to me, too, is you date the works. Like, for instance, uh, the soil piece. And for Barricade, you don't have a date, but you have the location. What determines for you whether you're going to time stamp it or location stamp it? I think it's something that I decided at one point, oh, I'll try and see if this works and maybe it doesn't work. I guess I haven't really figured it out as things are still relatively young in terms of how I process them and how I want to mark them. I don't know if you're, you might be too young to remember this, but back when all fo photographs were printed and it came from a shop, they might have a, t a date on the bottom of them. Like in the white frame of a Polaroid, yeah. there might be, it might say November 1967. And this kind of reminds me of that a little bit that you're trying to capture here and, and document a moment in time, even though it's an interpretive documentation. And what's also interesting to me and the photographer Errol Morris has written quite a bit about the spaces outside the frame. And I'm curious, what determines the frame for you? A lot of people who might work in nature might take a photo of something, and then that photo becomes how they frame the work. You're not working from that way. You're working from your own sight line. Obviously, your own sight line can encompass a wider, more expansive view than what you have in each of these paintings. What determines for you what is falls within and outside the boundaries? Uh, again, I think we're getting back to the idea of what a skateboarder, a BMX rider, a graffiti rider interprets when they hone in on something. This is the thing. It's a, a weird sort of grasping that moment and making the best of that choice that you made for that specific space. Having gone through these areas uh, maybe several times or happening upon it in a particular kind of light, I need to just go with this. I feel like there's been moments where there's hesitation that happens. In, in any of those sports that we're talking about or graffiti writing, hesitation can lead to not being able to finish or being just not fully engaged with that. So I want to be clear here. So when you're drawing the analogy with BMX riding or, or mount, mountain bike riding, that it's you have to make quick, immediate decisions and you just go with it. And you're doing the same with when you bring an easel out into the landscape. Yeah, I have a small like waterproof tripod and some uh, paper that's taped down to gator board, uh, a set of colors and a set of brushes, bringing in my own water, bringing in my own containers full of stuff that I, so I don't leave anything behind and I take everything with me because the idea is I'm not leaving any marks. I'm taking my marks with me. Interesting. One of the things I also want to ask you about was your color palette. It's heavy into greens and earth tones. And, but there's such subtle nuanced changes in your colors, often within one painting. Has that taken and does it continue to take on an experimental plane for you that every painting in a way you're experimenting with your colors? Yeah, I would say that every one of these is definitely going to be um, an experimentation with the color using the same palette. There's about nine or ten colors in all these paintings that I've mixed myself and tubed myself because they're based on colors that are inherent in Brevard, Mount Mitchell, Blue Ridge Parkway, Arboretum. One of them is called Lichen Green. And what I love about it so much is I've mixed it with the sole purpose that it yields four to five different colors in one stroke, depending on its intensity. And that creates a layer of chaos in that way. Just that watercolor is very chaotic for me. How do you get exacting or maybe you don't, but you're saying you might have four or five colors in one stroke from this paint that you have created yourself, this color you have tubed. What's the process of that? I take a bunch of colors that I like and we'll just mix them up and see what happens. It's not like mixing acrylic, which I'd been 
doing previously for a long time and it's not mixing spray paint colors which in the early 90s before spray paint was manufactured into a rainbow array of colors me and a good friend Corey would force paint into cans varying the pressures with different temperatures and create our own colors with standard rust-oleum or orchard paint so i don't know i think it's experimenting seeing what it does and it just seems like there's so little at stake or so little consequence to it so it's like why the hell not sure you mentioned a little bit ago that you've uh, used to work in acrylics and sprays why did you go to watercolors I don't have to have an air compressor. I don't have to have an airbrush. I don't have to have an airbrush cleaning kit. I don't have to have a frisket and blades and sitting there combing in the same orange for six to seven layers. The amount of time that a, say a 50 inch by 50 inch acrylic painting took six months. I'm sitting there looking at this thing for six months. It feels like torture. And this feels so far from that and it still feels so new and young that I don't know what to anticipate and I love that it's a less forgiving medium in some ways isn't it yes what were some of the lessons you learned in transitioning to that and realizing that it's a less forgiving medium when I wanted things to feel more graphic like the paintings in terms of its like wood blocky silk screeny printmaking sort of vibe knowing that like one wet color hits another that's it I had to devise certain ways to help keep things separated so I can maintain that graphic sort of feel which I ended up utilizing some of the techniques I'd would do an acrylic painting, which is leaving white canvas opened up as a means of outline using that same sort of feel in the paintings. It seemed to dialectically translate over really well. And I never would start an acrylic painting the same way and finish it the same way. And I maintain that sort of chaotic order within these paintings too, because then that keeps things fresh and it's like a it's if then statements. If I do this, then this, and then I can start to break that up in this sort of ludicrous quasi print making. Oh, if I do it like this, I'll do it like this. I'll do it like this and see what happens. Yeah. I, I didn't even ask you, but are you from an artistic family? My mom did stained glass for a bit, but I think it was just kind of like, oh, well, I want to do that sort of thing. My dad, he knew how to draw, but he just didn't do it as much. He's a mechanic, but he is somebody that can look at something, figure out how to fix it. My grandma would do crafts and she would take a look at an object and turn it into something. So taking a muscle shell and turning it into a seal with felt flippers and googly eyes. My other grandparents would collect shells and then paint on them. So there's some history. Did your family support your full pursuit in the arts? I believe so. I think there's certain moments where it's like when it came to the spray paint stuff, more than likely not. What do you mean more than likely? You never heard. You just suspect. I I think I, I had a pretty good idea that they didn't. So just wouldn't necessarily talk about it so much. And I think there would be times, why don't you paint a landscape? Why don't you paint such and such as barn? And at that time, hell no, I'm not doing that. Why so, don't you paint this person's barn? Yeah. <laughs> I know that's a thing, but that's funny that your parents would say that's a more honorable pursuit. Yeah. Or, or like, why don't you do this, that, or the other? And no, I'm doing this other thing. And so I would say like, definitely yes, but I think they've definitely seen the trials and tribulations of what art making is and how it operates. And I think they were more concerned, maybe can I live on it or not, et cetera. Yeah. Is this your first solo show since you've been in Asheville? This is the first solo show I've had in Asheville. And to my knowledge, I think ever being in a, in a designated gallery space. Wow, that's amazing. Certainly since you graduated, you probably got an exhibitions in college. But in, in college, it would be group, group shows. shows right? So or, this is your first real solo show. Yeah, and it's with work that I had no anticipation of ever showing. When I started making watercolors, it was more like, I need something to do when I go camping. And then all of a sudden, it just 
oh, I get to be outside more. I get to be outside more. I get to interact with. So you, you had no uh, inclination to show this work. How did no. Mira Gerard find you and find this work? I think I found out that she had been following me on Instagram for quite some time, and I had no idea, but I had been to about four or five shows here since moving here to Asheville, and I knew immediately I would love to show some work here, and it just it just happened. I didn't pursue it in any way, shape, or form, and it just manifested on its own. You didn't intend for this work to be shown. It all captures moments in time. Do you know where your moments in time are taking you artistically? Where is your artwork headed? That's what I don't know, and I like not knowing, just like making a graffiti piece out of nothing just like the paintings never had sketches it would start with one particular thing that would then grow into something else that had more kinship to printmaking or even collage mentality than actual like start to finish painting and these still operate in that sort of same way i'm doing one larger studio watercolor right now the idea is that i want to go larger and see where that sort of goes. And then, I don't know, uh, I think that's the, the next step is if I go bigger, then what does that mean for the imagery itself and how I react to that environment? Are your parents coming in for this show? I don't believe my parents are going to be coming in for the show, but oh. I think that I'll be sending them some photographs and videos and stuff like that. I, I was just asking about your parents because it would be a, like a real validation. Look, look, mom, look, dad, look what's arrived. Look I, what I've done. I think the last show that they actually went to see was my graduate school exhibition when I was graduating Columbia. The work has changed a lot since then. Yeah, it's, a, it's constantly evolving. And I don't know, I guess I'm just excited to see where it takes me, but having no anticipations, less roadblocks. You can catch Chris Jaley's solo exhibition at Tiger Tiger Gallery in the River Arts District through the end of March. If you value the Overlook's place in Asheville's media landscape, please consider joining dozens of others who are supporting the show through my Patreon crowdfunding page. Become a member for as little as $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash the Overlook podcast. Our First Look newsletter gives you just a handful of daily headlines from around the local media landscape to get you on your morning. We also have a weekly newsletter devoted to all things The Overlook that hits you every Friday. Both are free and available at podavl.com slash newsletter. The theme song for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes to us courtesy of the Asheville duo The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on any social media channel at AVL Overlook. And I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook with Matt Pikin.